This is Rakesh's first time presenting at Nanog, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking with us today. Welcome, Rakesh. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the session on building trustworthy network infrastructure. My main focus in this session is going to be about the basic building block of any network, which is the network device itself, like a router. I'm going to talk about the various threats uh, related to a network device and how can we start building trust into it so that we can extend the same trust into the rest of the network. Before getting into the details, a brief introduction about myself. I'm Rakesh Kandula. I'm a technical marketing engineer at Cisco. I have been with Cisco for more than 16 years now in various roles. My current focus areas are trustworthy systems, platform security chips, secure boot, DDoS, etc. Outside my day job, uh, I'm a regular runner, marathoner. I love doing trail ultras. So getting to the session, a year back, I was actually reading this interesting book by this author, Yuval Noah Harari. The book is Unstoppable Us. It's about how we as humans took over the world. Now, what really caught my attention when I was reading this book is the statement uh, that he makes. And I could relate directly to the security domain. So what he says is, People need stories in order to cooperate. Now, as security professionals, I'm sure at least some of you might have faced questions like, hey, is this security feature really needed? Or can we reduce the budget for security? Or security makes operational workflows really complex. So it's not that people don't want to cooperate with the security teams, right? Once we educate the teams internally, once we talk to them about all the uh, dynamic threat landscape outside, that's when you can expect people to cooperate. But most importantly, the second part of the statement is what relates to security. Uh, what he says is the same people can change the way they cooperate by changing the stories that they believe. Now, in security domain, there are newer threats coming in every day. So if you deploy some security features today and just forget about it, it's not going to help you. It's a dynamic, ever-changing threat landscape out there, right? So my goal for the next 50 to 60 minutes is to raise awareness about what could be the threats to a network device, how can we build trust into those devices so that you can take back this learning, educate your teams internally, and hopefully have more meaningful conversations when it comes to security. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the agenda for today. So I'll first talk about some of the unique service provider security concerns. What makes the service provider deployments unique? And then let's start digging in about what trustworthy platforms are. What are the challenges and the potential uh, solutions to uh, address them? And lastly, I would also want to talk a bit about how can we strengthen the operational security aspects. And here I'm going to introduce some uh, new interesting developments uh, around operational security. So let's get started. Now, if you look at any typical service provider deployment, most of the times your devices are deployed somewhere outdoors. So having a physical security always is not going to be possible, right? So most of the times, you have these devices in untrusted remote locations. And with increasing 5G deployments, the problem is only going to become worse. Then, a service provider network typically supports critical infrastructure of a nation. So imagine any attack on a service provider network would actually mean you're attacking a nation's backbone, a nation's economy. And lastly, the scale. The scale of a service provider network generally spans across a nation or in some cases globally, right? So how can we scale uh, deploying hundreds or maybe thousands of devices 
and provision them securely, right? That's another unique challenge that service providers have to take care of. Now, once you see an attack on a network, obviously there is a loss of revenue. There is no doubt about it. But more than that, think of the brand reputation loss. All the trust you would have built with your customers over the years could be wiped out with just a single attack, right? And then impact to SLAs. If you are managing a network that provides services to other enterprises or some business critical applications, imagine the impact to those SLAs. And lastly, the legal implications. If any of the attacks result in loss of customer data, loss of any sensitive data, there would be legal implications too, right? So given this kind of a situation out there, let's now dissect a single network device and look at what could be those potential threats at each of these layers. So starting off at a very basic level, which is the hardware, the threats could be one of the most common problem, fake or counterfeit hardware, right? Or else hardware that has been compromised. So no amount of software security or latest and greatest protocols will help us if your hardware itself has been compromised. Or moving to the next layer, uh, like the kernel or the boot process, there could be rootkits or boot kits, right, which are persistent. So there could be threats for the actual boot process itself. And then the next layer, which is obviously the runtime, the application time, which is where there could be credential theft or there could be meddler in the middle, uh, leading to attacks like ransomware and things like that. In addition to these three layers, most often uh, we also tend to ignore the visibility aspect. How can we provide visibility of a given network device once it is deployed? How can you periodically, constantly look at the device posture? So let's start looking at each of these layers and let's see how a trustworthy platform would look like. So as I said, trust must begin in the hardware. We need to have a mechanism to ensure the integrity of the hardware itself. Followed by that, we need to have a way to make sure you could trust the boot process. You could trust the way the network operating system is actually booted. Then a given device will have to be in the network for probably a few years, right? So how do you maintain that same level of trust over the entire lifetime of that device? And that's where we need to talk about runtime defenses, data protection, and uh, protecting against DDoS attacks and things like that. And last element, how can we report on trust? How could you periodically attest the device posture? So let's take a look at what are those core components uh, which could make or constitute a trustworthy platform. So as I said, let's start off first with the basic foundational element, which is the hardware integrity. So if you look at what could be the potential problems, now there are increasing attacks, increasing attempts uh, to tamper the uh, hardware that is shipped from a network vendor. So there is a lot of uh, supply chain attacks that are going on. And there are increasing att uh, attempts to put Trojans on the chips as well, right? Now, again, this is not fictional. If you have nation state attackers with enough intent and resources, yes, it is possible. And what that means is the mission critical components on a router, like the CPU or the forwarding ASIC, they could be compromised. They could be tampered with. So you need to have a mechanism in your hardware that can detect any sort of tampering that happens during the transit. Then, counterfeit hardware, one of the biggest problems, right? So you do have uh, all these devices, the fake devices being sold in illegal markets, which look like from a branded uh, network vendor, but it's at end of the day, fake hardware. Then, the other common problem we came across is tampered hardware, genuine hardware, but that has been tampered and being sold in these uh, resale markets. So that's another big problem. Then another interesting uh, problem to address is unique hardware identity. How can you cryptographically identify your hardware so that you know you are actually talking to that same device that you deployed? So the reason you need that sort of identity is, if you remember, I said one of the biggest problems with service providers is scale, the scale of the network. 
So if you have to automate the provisioning of thousands of devices, you should have a secure and a standards-based mechanism to do that. So having a way to uniquely identify the device helps in this process. So what are the solutions? So let's start off with the first basic requirement for any sort of hardware integrity, right? You should be able to have a tamper-proof cryptographic unique identity. We can no longer have static identifier that is programmed in a EEPROM or uh, in some part of a flash memory. No, that's very easily tampered. Uh, and if you're talking about nation state uh, sponsored attacks, then yes, it's not going to help. So we need to start pushing for having a cryptographic identity that could be challenged uh, when uh, once your network device is deployed in the network. Then another solution would be to have something like a security chip on your routers that can help uh, ensure the integrity of any of the critical components. Like I'm, I was talking about the CPU or the ASIC being tampered in transit. So having some sort of a security chip to ensure or validate if the router is still having the same CPU or the ASIC that a vendor has shipped is very critical. Then we need to make it mandatory to be able to detect tampering if there has been any sort of uh, tampering at the hardware layer or for your uh, cryptographic algorithms, can we have hardware supported uh, entropy generation and things like that. And most important aspect, like I said, you cannot just forget once you deploy a device, you need to constantly uh, look at the device posture. So the ability to support someone uh, to attest the device remotely should also be supported. So what I mean by attestation is, Let's say you deployed a device today, six months later, if you want to make sure you're still talking to that same device, you should be able to uh, challenge the device to provide its unique identity, identity, right? That's one. Or let's say you want to make sure the boot process uh, actually was secure. You want to collect some boot measurements. So these are the things that come under the umbrella of attestation. So these Four elements should be the basic uh, requirements when we talk about ensuring the hardware integrity. Then let's move on to the next level, which is the boot integrity. So if you look at the whole boot process, potential uh, scenarios for tampering would be some attacker trying to change the boot uh, interface or bypassing the integrity checks or trying to boot from an alternate device. And if uh, any of you were following the recent advisory from CISA, it clearly talked about some nation state sponsored attackers trying to compromise the firmware that is loaded on the routers or attempts to downgrade to uh, images or binaries that were known to be vulnerable, right? So this again is no longer fictional. There has been an advisory issued just a week or 10 days back, right? Now the interesting problem with boot attacks is they are persistent. So even after you reload your router, even a power cycle of the device would still make you vulnerable. So let's take a look at how we could potentially solve some of the problems. So the most important element that you would need for the boot process is what we call secure boot. So essentially what secure boot does is to validate every stage of the boot process. So it would check for the integrity before it actually goes to the next stage. Now, most of the network vendors have only CPU-based, what we call as a CPU-based secure boot, right? But given the kind of attacks that we are seeing, we cannot just live with a secure boot based off just a CPU. We need to have a hardware immutable route of trust that you could actually trust and acts as an anchor to the boot process. Because remember, we are talking about establishing trust for the lifetime of the router, right? So you need to start building that trust with a firm trust anchor. And that is where we should start pushing towards immutable hardware root of trust based secure boot. CPU secure boot is just not enough. Then, as I said, we should have an ability to validate all the boot process, boot artifacts, and that is what secure boot means. But in addition to that, how do you prove that the device actually went through that secure process? So you should have an ability to record some of those boot measurements. So having, remember I said, it's good to have a security chip or something like a TPM chip, a trusted platform module. 
it should have the ability to record the boot measurements as well. And then it's good if you have secure boot, but what if an attacker tries to disable it? So secure boot should not be optional. You should not provide a knob to be able to disable it. Any adversary must not be able to disable it. So that should be a mandatory requirement. And lastly, we should start looking at supporting downgrade protection. So an attacker, just like the CISA advisory I was talking about, attackers must not be able to boot any revoked images. So we should have a boot process that can ensure we are only able to load images that are not revoked and we should have some sort of downgrade protection as well. Then once we have ensured that, okay, there is uh, your hardware could be trusted, your boot process could be trusted, the next logical uh, step is ensuring the runtime integrity. And this is the most critical point because ensuring the same trust level for the rest of the lifetime of the router is going to be critical. So what are the typical challenges we see? So let's accept the fact there will always be attacks. There will always be attackers out there trying to attack your network, trying to attack your router, right? So no vendor can claim 100% security. But we should at least have a way to detect if there has been an attempt to tamper, right? So having a mechanism to detect any sort of tampering is very important. So that's what we need to look at. Then we should have a mechanism wherein uh, a process, if it is trying to access an unauthorized resource, so let's say you have an attacker and they're trying to access, let's say, uh, compromise a process and it's trying to access some resource on the disk or maybe accessing the config data, that should not be allowed, right? So we should have strict set of access controls. Then we should also ensure that any file before it gets executed, we should be able to uh, validate the integrity of it. So we should have a mechanism to do that. And these days, it's very common to run applications uh, in the form of Docker containers on your routers. So uh, it could be for network monitoring purposes uh, or uh, automating your deployments and things like that. So given that sort of a situation, we should be able to prevent unauthorized third-party applications or containers from running on your routers. So let's take a look at a couple of things that could be done, right? Uh, one option is if you want to ensure access controls, uh, we could adopt SE Linux. Essentially, it provides the mandatory access controls uh, to be built in. So the problem of a process trying to access a resource which it's not supposed to could be solved by that. Then to solve the problem of integrity of the files before execution, uh, Linux has a solution. The IMA, integrity measurement architecture, can come to the rescue. So essentially, at the kernel layer, uh, before a process can uh, execute it, it verifies the integrity of the file. So if you look at it, uh, this is an example of a file being loaded. As you see, each file's corresponding hash would be stored locally, and also that would be signed by uh, a key called IMA specific key. So essentially what kernel does is, it does a sort of measurement or appraisal, wherein it first verifies the signature on that file, then verifies the hash of the file, and only when they look okay, that file gets executed. So this solves the problem of uh, integrity of the files before executing. And on top of it, if you also have a platform chip like a TPM, these uh, measurements could be extended inside the chip. There are some registers uh, that record it, and you could replay them offline later to see uh, if you could still trust your device posture. Now, again, those are just a couple of examples uh, that we could use. There are tons of other runtime defenses, uh, but uh, I just wanted to give a brief about what are the threats that are possible and potential uh, options. Now, putting these three things together, as I said, the most important layer is visibility. Once you have ensured the integrity at the hardware layer, the boot layer, boot process, and runtime integrity, how do you verify it? So that is where the visibility aspect comes in. So if you talk about trust visibility, we need visibility at the boot aspect. We call it as boot integrity visibility. So there has to be some mechanism for you to prove that, yes, this device went through secure boot process. And then a mechanism to uh, ensure the runtime integrity is also needed. So we'll look at that. And I will explain what a remote attestation workflow looks like, what we mean by attestation. So. Before we get into that, 
if you have to establish trust with someone or something, there are two main aspects that you would need. One, you should have a mechanism to collect some sort of measurements and be able to record them and then be able to verify them against the expected value. Like let's say you're entering the, uh, so when I was at the immigration, obviously my passport is a, a entity that would be used to verify. So measurement is me, my fingerprints over there, which are giving that measurements. And the officer would have verified this against the details against my passport, right? A simple thing. Let's translate that into the net networking world and let's see what the measurements could be and how you could verify. So let's start off with the boot process. So when we talk about boot integrity visibility, as I said, secure boot should be mandatory. But on top of secure boot, we should also make what is called as measured boot mandatory. What we mean by that is, a secure boot will verify every boot stage. On top of it, with measured boot, all those verifications or validations that are being done, all those measurements would be recorded inside these TPM chips or a security chip if you have. So there is something called PCRs, platform configuration registers that these chips commonly have. So by having this kind of a uh, measurement recorded, you could use that at a later point of time to compare if this is the expected measurement. So if you're running a version X uh, for a particular device and you have the measurements coming from the chip, now you compare them and you know that, yes, now I can trust that it actually went through the secure boot process and it's actually running the intended version of the operating system, right? So now let's see how a typical remote attestation workflow looks like to ensure runtime uh, integrity visibility, right? So a workflow could be very simple. Think of uh, any offline survey uh, automation scripts or some service that you have. You could constantly challenge the device to provide a set of things that are needed to ensure the integrity of it, right? So it could be uh, the unique identity I talked about. It could be the boot measurements or any runtime measurements. And once you collect that, you could verify uh, if the data is actually same as what it was on day one when you deployed, or if there has been a change. And then you know what is the current device posture, right? So you could have this kind of a remote attestation workflow, and that helps in uh, uh, having uh, validating your device posture over its rest of the lifetime, right? Okay, so so far we talked a lot about ensuring the integrity of the device itself, uh, features that a network vendor will have to provide, right? Now let's talk about the operational security, wherein features that you as network operators will have to explicitly enable so that you can strengthen the overall uh, security posture of your devices. So let's start off with a very basic thing, getting into the router, logging into the router, right? So the user identity access. So if you look at it, I hope no one is using Telnet anymore to get into the device. I hope SSH is what everyone uses. But even with SSH, if you look at any attacks, any of the major attacks, most common uh, reason would be credential uh, compromise, right? So let's do a with, uh, we don't want passwords anymore. Either, I'm sorry, uh, either let's go with a key, public key based uh, uh, authentication or much better certificate based authentication, even if you are using SSH. And especially, as I said again, service providers have this uh, huge scale, hundreds of thousands of devices. So a certificate based option is much easier to scale but at least a key-based authentication is much better than still using passwords. And disable any weak ciphers that you might be using with SSH. The second option, multi-factor authentication. Just like when you get onto your uh, company's uh, VPN or Gmail or anything like that, it's good to enable two-factor authentication even for your network admins getting onto the routers. And I'm going to introduce later today about an interesting concept called consent-based security. Think of it as a third level of uh, protection uh, for sensitive security features. So we'll talk about it uh, once I introduce the concept of ownership in some time. Then it's mandatory to have AAA controls for authentication, authorization, and accounting. Make sure you always have dynamic authentication enabled, have proper user role segregation, let's not give root access to every network admin out there, right? So it should be based on uh, their specific role. And if you're using password policy, uh, password still, uh, at least have very strong password policies. 
and also uh, there are lots of stronger password hashing mechanisms available now so uh, we should be adopting that and uh, for things like syslogs and all of that uh, use syslogs over tls use snmp v3 uh, and things like that again uh, the domain of strengthening your operational security is huge uh, i just wanted to highlight some of the important basic things that uh, you need to look at then comes a very interesting uh, area which is the data protection data at, re uh, at rest and also data sanitization so let's start with sensitive data protection on your routers sensitive data when it comes to routers mostly is your configuration data because that has a lot of information about your network uh, it could have any key strings that you use for protocols and things like that so think of an attacker who has physical access to your box and is able to take that hard disk out mount it on a linux machine and trying to uh, uh, get to that configuration data right that's a very valid threat as i said service provider devices are typically deployed in untrusted remote locations. So given this situation, we need to at least enable full disk encryption or partial disk encryption, depends on uh, what the vendor supports, but some sort of uh, encryption to protect any sensitive data should be mandatory. And it's much better if that encryption key could be protected by hardware. And that's where I again come back to that security chip. If you can have something like that on your devices, it's good that you protect the encryption key as well by those chips. And lastly, you should also have a mechanism to delete those encryption keys when you're decommissioning your devices. So when it, in the context of data protection, most of the times we only talk about these three, data at rest, which is protecting your sensitive data. So encryption, we just talked about it. Data in transit, which could be enabling MACSEC or IPSEC or TLS connection. So yes, you have taken care of data in transit. And then data in use, like any runtime defenses that you have, like uh, SE Linux that I talked about, IMA enforcement and things like that, they will ensure that data that is actually being executed is also protected. But there is a fourth aspect, which most of the times is uh, getting ignored. So let's see how many of you are actually paying attention so far. So I actually gave a clue about what that fourth missing element could be. Any guesses? No? Consent-based security. I'm sorry? Consent-based security. Cons Consent? Yeah. No? It's something that I just mentioned the slide before. <laughs> I'm sorry? OK, so it's about data sanitization. When I talked about data protection, I said, data at rest protection and sanitizing the data. And this is the thing that a lot of service providers are actually ignoring. In fact, a lot of big financial institutions recently have been heavily fined because they were not sanitizing the data when they were decommissioning the devices. So we must have a decommissioning process. We must ensure any persistent data components, they are sanitized before you either return the gear, before you sell it uh, for resale, or before you decommission. And that should be auditable. You should have an audit process that could ensure that, yes, this particular router went through my process of decommissioning. And also given uh, the push towards sustainability initiatives, a lot of vendors have buyback programs and all of that. So if you want to do that, the first step is you want to make sure you clear your data, right? You don't want that your device to be returned to a vendor with all the config data still there. So in conclusion, data sanitization must be part of your organization's data security policies. So don't ignore this part. Most of the times we are only uh, worried about uh, data during the lifetime of the router, but decommissioning is actually a very important step. And now let's come to some interesting newer developments in the area of security. So today I want to talk about an interesting concept called ownership establishment. So let me introduce the concept uh, with a simple real world physical example. Let's say you're going to buy a car. You go to a dealer, you buy the car, it gets delivered to you. Then you typically uh, provide the proof of buying it, the chassis serial number, and then your unique uh, identification like social security. Then you go to your local transport authority and then you get it registered. 
So the transport authority in the back end verifies if it's uh, a genuine uh, person that actually bought the car and then verifies your identity and then you get your registration card. Simple process, right? And that's when you as a customer would have truly established ownership of that particular car. Let's translate this to networking domain now and let's see what we mean by this, right? So that transport authority becomes a vendor's what is called as a MASA service. I'll just introduce that in a minute. The chassis serial number translates to router serial number. The identity, and this is the most important point. In networking domain, what we mean by that is onboarding your own certificate. So that's how you are establishing your own identity or own, your ownership on the router. And then the registration card is nothing but what we call as ownership watcher uh, in this whole process. So let me talk through the process, how it works. Let's say you purchase a router from a uh, vendor. Now vendors have started putting up a service called MASA. It's called Manufacturer Authorized Signing Authority. So essentially after you purchase your router, you will essentially share the serial number with the uh, vendor and give your public certificate that you want to onboard. And with that, the vendors using their MASA service will verify is this a genuine customer and does the serial number really belong to this particular customer? And then they issue something called as a voucher ownership voucher. And once you onboard that voucher onto your device, you can establish your own certificate. So you have truly established ownership of that device. Again, this is all standards based. As I said, we should have secure and standards based mechanisms. So this is an RFC 8366 on which the entire concept of ownership voucher is based on. So if you look at uh, uh, some of the artifacts, uh, uh, the Critical points, uh, critical ones are serial number and the pin domain cert, your identity uh, that are used to issue a voucher to you. So let's take a look at uh, how this kind of a ownership establishment will help you, right? Especially in the context of onboarding uh, securely uh, devices at high scale. So as I said, service providers have to uh, solve this unique problem of deploying devices uh, at a very uh, huge scale. So zero touch provisioning has been around for a while. A lot of vendors have been supporting it, but it inherently had three major security flaws. The first aspect is, how does your provisioning server know I'm actually talking to the right router? How do I know it's not uh, a fake device over there that is put up by some rogue uh, entity? Second, how will the router know it's actually talking to the right provisioning server? How can I trust that server? And the third problem was trusting the artifacts that come during this provisioning process. How do I uh, uh, trust that configuration data? How can I trust the scripts that are being uh, onboarded during the boot process, right? So having this concept of ownership and a unique hardware identity that's, uh, that I mentioned earlier, we can solve this entire process, uh, problem. Again, this is a standard secure ZTP process. It's a RFC, RFC 8572. That is helping us solve this problem again. So let's look at the first problem, router validation. So as I said, once we start having a unique cryptographic hardware identity for our devices, now the provisioning server, it can challenge the device and say, hey, router, what is your cryptographic identity? Sign it and give me back your identity. Then the server would actually verify the signature. Then it'll look at the identity. And then it knows, yes, I'm talking to that same router with this particular serial number. Now I can go ahead and provision this device, right? That's how we can solve the first problem of router identity. Then we need to solve the problem of server validation and also the artifact validation. So this is being solved by that whole concept of ownership vouchers or ownership establishment. So the way it works is, once you have taken the ownership of the devices, that ownership voucher is typically signed by the vendor itself, right? So the router can trust it. So what you do at the very bottom that I'm showing, you get a voucher from the vendor, get it signed by the vendor, and you onboard the voucher onto the router. Once you do that, the certificate from your CA is going to be installed on the device, so then it can start talking to the server over a TLS connection and it can trust the server. So we are solving the problem of server trust by establishing the ownership. Then the third problem is 
How do you trust all the configuration data, all the scripts and everything? Simple, now that you have established the ownership, sign all those artifacts with your own keys and now the router has your identity, right? So it can verify the signature and it will onboard those artifacts. So this is how you can solve the problem of deployment at scale and you can still do it in a secure fashion. Then, this is just one example of taking, uh, establishing ownership or things like that. So remember I said in the context of uh, multi-factor authentication, there is another evolving concept called additional consent-based security features. So let me introduce that concept to you. Typically, as a network admin, we, uh, when you try to enable a feature today, I'm just taking an example of CLI, but you could as well talk about a gRPC or a NetConf uh, query. The moment uh, you log into the network device and you are authorized to actually run a particular config or enable a feature, you would be allowed, right? There's no questions asked. But with this whole concept of consent, what you could do is the device will not blindly accept that command from the network admin. It would actually challenge the uh, network admin to confirm if this feature is actually intended to be enabled or is this a rogue admin trying to enable some sensitive feature. Again, we'll talk about what could be those sensitive features, but if you look at it, what the router will do is it will generate a unique nonce and say, go get this approved by your security team, right? Now the security team can sign the challenge thrown by the router and then give it back to the network admin. And only then after verifying that consent, uh, the feature could be enabled or disabled. Now you might say, why do I need this? The most common use case is lawful interception. In fact, there are some uh, European nations, uh, uh, spe specifically France, it has a regulation now that any lawful interception enablement or uh, disabling it, it must go through this additional consent. So having this kind of uh, additional challenge response mechanism will make sure a feature like lawful interception is not misused even by rogue internal employees. So when we talk about security, it's not always outsiders trying to attack your network. We should also look at internal employees gone rogue and trying to misuse something, right? So this, this kind of consent is going to help you there. Now, how is that whole concept of ownership helping you in this? If you noticed, there is that uh, operator's public key that is actually onboarded onto the router. How did you onboard that using that voucher? So once you took the ownership of the device, once you have onboarded your own public certificate, you could sign the, any artifacts. It could be a zero touch provisioning boot artifact, or you could also sign this challenge and give it back. So taking ownership of a device by establishing your own identity on a device is only going to open up these kind of interesting use cases. Uh, again, for today's discussion, I wanted to just give a high level uh, introduction to all of these and what are the things that are possible, but these are the new developments happening uh, and this whole concept of ownership. And quantum, quantum is a buzzword these days, right? So again, I'll not get into too much details of uh, what solutions you have, you should, uh, or things like uh, what should be done or is it even real and things like that. So let's leave that aside. Assuming that there is a quantum computer that's going to come and assuming it's some sort of a black box sitting there doing some magic. What is the impact to us as network operators? I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about, should you be really worried? Should you be doing something today? Or should you be waiting for some more time uh, till a quantum computer uh, is actually available for commercial usage, right? So let's start off with what's the problem going to be? So as, as it's all in the news, everyone's trying to come up with a, build a new quantum computer nothing new, but assuming maybe to tomorrow or maybe 10 years from now or five years, let's assume there is a sufficiently large and reliable quantum computer that's built. The problem is once you have that, it can break the current encryption. Specifically, all the public key algorithms that we use today can be broken if you have a quantum computer available. But what does that mean to us as operators? So if you look at it, 
We'll take a simple example of, let's say, uh, something like a MACSEC or an IPSEC session, or maybe even a TLS connection, right? So there are typically two phases of your connection. The first phase is where you authenticate both the devices, and then you uh, start doing the key negotiation, and you establish the key, right? That's phase one. And the derived keys are actually used to do the actual encryption in the data path. So if you look at the algorithms that are used in the phase one of that authentication and key derivation, they are all based on asymmetric uh, cryptography, and these are the algorithms that could be broken by a quantum computer, like uh, RSA or a Diffie-Hellman, right? These are very much susceptible. So the underlying data path encryption actually uses symmetric algorithms, so with sufficiently large key length, that is not susceptible. But what's the point? If you have a quantum computer, and if it is able to decrypt that first uh, part of the session, you have the key with you. So you don't have to break that symmetric crypto anymore. I have the key and I can straight away decrypt the entire data, right? So what does that mean? Like today you don't have a quantum computer available. So how do I, why should you really care about it? The problem is attackers, Today, they can tap all the flows. They don't have to do anything because there is no quantum computer out there, so you cannot break that asymmetric crypto. But let's say five or 10 years from now, when you have that quantum computer, when you have that magic box available for you, attackers can then decrypt that authentication session and they can derive the session keys that were used and then your entire data path traffic could be decrypted. And that's the problem. That is why we should look at it. But the next question is, should everyone be worried about it? Or is it limited to some specific uh, set of deployments? And that's where the key is. So if you are supporting a sensitive deployment that requires forward secrecy for at least five years or maybe 10 years, then yes, you must act today. It could be a military network or a federal or a defense agency or any financial, big financial institutions, uh, banks, or even if you're a service provider catering to an enterprise, and if they have very sensitive data that they deem to be sensitive and needs protection for let's say five or 10 years, then you must do something now, right? But let's say if you have some part of your network which is not very critical, very short-lived session, uh, let's say I'm booking a movie tickets today, my TLS session, I don't care after five years. Even the credit card I used for that uh, movie booking, it might have expired, so I don't care, right? So you, as a network operator, have to look at your entire network, look at what are those sensitive parts that need uh, protection for, let's say, next five or 10 years, and you look at some sort of a quantum protections uh, only to that, right? You don't have to look at enabling this for your entire uh, fleet of devices. The potential solutions, as I said, will not get into the details. It's, it's a huge uh, uh, ocean in itself, but what you could do in the near term, in the short term and medium term is this. Uh, as I said, the entire symmetric cryptography or symmetric uh, crypto algorithms are not susceptible uh, to these quantum algorithms. So why not use some sort of shared key mechanism, even for your negotiation, that first phase I talked about, you could do that. So that's the easiest option available. Most of the network vendors support that today. Uh, like if you take example of MaxEC, it's called pre-shared key. That's all supported by every network vendor out there. So you could start considering using uh, uh, the pre-shared key or what we call as PSK-based MaxEC deployment. That'll, that's going to help you with zero cost, zero network upgrade, and it'll solve the problem uh, right away. Or for more paranoid or uh, really secretive deployments or uh, what we have seen is a lot of interest from defense agencies and they really want to be sure that the keys uh, are generated by quantum hardware. So there are a lot of vendors out there uh, coming, coming up with quantum key generators uh, where the keys are generated based on some optical parameters and even if someone tries to tap uh, the link, the devices can detect that there is uh, a change in an optical parameter and you will know that the link is being tampered, right? So that is a medium term option. 
if you have enough resources and if you have a enough use case where uh, you can uh, have an external quantum safe uh, key generators, that's the medium term option. But what's the long term story? The long term is we need to make sure we have uh, post quantum uh, crypto algorithms approved. Uh, NIST is currently working on putting, uh, I think it has put up some proposals and it's uh, under review process. But eventual long term solution, uh, we need to start implementing the post quantum algorithms. So once it goes through the entire review process and we have algorithms approved by NIST and other standards bodies, that is where the long term would be. So if I have to summarize uh, the session for today, we started off with this, dissecting a network device at each of the layers and we looked at what are the potential problems at each of them and the solutions that we talked about it. To summarize, if you want to solve uh, the threats at the hardware layer, we should push for a unique cryptographic hardware identity. It cannot be a static identity uh, programmed in some EEPROM or a flash anymore. We need to start having platform security chips, or at least the TPM chips uh, on the devices, and a secure boot process that's anchored in some hardware trust anchor. CPU-based secure boot is not going to be sufficient anymore. Then we looked at the next layer above, the boot layer. So uh, having measure, uh, methods like measured boot, SE Linux uh, for mandatory access controls, IMA architecture, to ensure the integrity of files. These are the, some of the things we should uh, look at. Some of these we should push for the vendors to implement as well. So I understand there are operators and also network vendors here. So uh, we need to make sure uh, we go in that direction. Then for the runtime aspects, we talked about the problems and the solutions would be enabling uh, disk encryption, either full disk or a partial disk encryption having some sort of a remote attestation workflow so that you can constantly verify your device posture uh, to verify the device identity, some mechanism, secure onboarding of your devices at scale and uh, implementing some operational security features like uh, taking ownership, additional consent and things like that. So that brings us to the end of my session for today. So uh, I think we have some time for questions. Feel free to uh, Ask if any. Uh, Steve Ulrich, Arista Networks. I was curious as to whether you had any thoughts about standardizing things like uh, measured, uh, measured boot or standardizing on things like PCRs um, in order to facilitate kind of consistency across implementations. Yes, so it, it is all, that's a very good question. So if you look at the TCG, Trusted Computing Group, uh, it's already standardized. So what we call as, uh, it's called UFI Secure Boot. Uh, so as long as your Secure Boot is compliant to the UFI standard, UEFI, uh, the set of PCRs are standard. So the spec says any security chip, any TPM chip, registers from zero to seven, record the boot measurements. Then you have a other dedicated register to record any runtime measurements. So this has been already standardized. So all we need is for vendors to start uh, being compliant to the TCG specification and we should be good there. Yeah, I, I guess my comment there is like, even within the realm of PCR zero to seven, there's significant room for interpretation and yes. for vendors to have different components going into the measurement process. So um, there's kind of a, a meta question there as to, um, and I was just curious as to whether you had any thoughts on how vendors could standardize that. So uh, I agree, I mean, other than, uh, so yes, between zero to seven, there are, depending on how a particular net vendor's NOS is actually booting, what entity goes into that uh, is vendor specific implementation. At best, I would say uh, it's something that each vendor will have to look at. Uh, the point is, if you are trying to use this uh, measured boot or uh, use secure boot, you also need the reference measurements anyway. And your reference measurements are going to change even for a given vendor between different versions, right? Because you might have changed some entity in your BIOS or some part uh, in your kernel. So anyway, there will be some sort of vendor dependent aspect to it. So I can't really say we, we could get 100% uh, vendor agnostic implementation because the NOS is unique to every vendor again. And that's the challenge I, I, I see over there. 
But as a service provider or operators, if they want to use that, they should work with the vendors and make sure each vendor publishes the expected measurements. Like if you're running a version ABC, what should be the expected uh, boot measurements for that version? And tomorrow you release another one, make sure the vendor releases what are the expected measurements for that particular release. And then you could have your own workflows to uh, compare them, right? Thank you. No problem. Thank you.